My name is Kate, and if I have not, hi, good morning. In case I haven't met you, um, but I wanted just to share a little bit about you as we've been talking about the ministries of the church through our stewardship time. I'm here to talk about worship. I know, it's a stretch. But I wanted to, I think I was home two weeks after, my, after I got off tour with Continental Singers in 1986. And Charles Harris grabbed me in the hall one Sunday and goes, uh, you know you need to inquire. Uh, <laughs> okay, I mean when Charles Harris said you need to get up there, you need to get up there and, and say that. And I've been, I, truthfully, in and out through, from the time I was 10 years old, I stood right there and accepted Jesus at the end of confirmation class and have gone through the children's department, the youth department, young adults, and adult ministries. And the key for me is worship. I don't know if you remember the story of Eric Little in the 1924 uh, Olympics. He was called the, the Flying Scotsman. And he uh, was born in China to missionary parents in China. Um, and when he was in the Olympics, he came under scrutiny because he would not run on Sunday. He was extremely fast set all kinds of new world records at the time. And he, he said, God made me for a purpose, for China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. That's how it is for me. When I sing, I feel God's pleasure. And the, the areas of worship that I have been privileged to be a part of. I brought three things to kind of show you the, the three areas that I worship the Lord corporately. One is through chord charts that we use in contemporary uh, praise. So when I sing with the praise team, these are what we use. When I sing with the choir, this is what we use. The anthems that are written to glorify God, and that's really the object of worship, to glorify God. And corporately, with a hymnal. These are some of the greatest hymns that I think have ever been written. And I've been in many different denominational churches. And there's nobody like Charles Wesley. And all three of these are, are tools that help me worship God, which is critical in our, our faith walk. Amen? But it's not the only way you worship. You worship through prayer, through study, through communion, through singing, and through giving. Everything we do is to glorify God and to help share Jesus with others. So even sometimes if you don't know the tune or you don't know the words, allow God to <clears throat> minister to you through the gift of music and the gift of worship. And I think you'll find sometimes that these tunes may just run around in your head. And as you sing to the Lord, you worship and you glorify Him. That's why we give of ourselves. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Anthony Skinner. I'm the chairman of the Finance Committee. And I'm the downer after Kate's great speech. <laughs> uh, that was very good, Kate. Thank you. But uh, we're in the midst of what we call our stewardship campaign. 
which is basically when we all look at our giving to the church and what we plan to do for next year. Now, in your bulletin, it's a card that looks like this. On one side, it has our theme verse, Galatians 6, 9. And on the other side, it has uh, a place to put your, your name and contact information, but also what you plan to give next year, your tithes, offerings, etc. Uh, that's a very, you know, why do we do this? Well, there are practical reasons for it. The first one is the cards that we receive will guide the establishment of the budget, the church budget for next year. That's the formal reason. The informal, an informal reason is to, to remind everybody how they're doing what they're giving. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> Most of us are a little behind, but we intend to catch up. But what we have been trying to do over the uh, last few weeks is in a very broad brush way, talk about the ministries that go on here at Tyler Street. You all got a, a bookmark like this, or you should have. And on one side we have those, those ministries, broad brush, missions, children, youth, the branch, the adults, education, and finally worship. And we have representations of those, each of those down here on the communion table to, to give us a visual reminder of what's going on here. And most of you probably think, well, I know what's going on here. Yeah. But it's, it's good to hear it again sometimes. And so the question, you know, the, the formal question about this card is, what am I going to give next year? But the real question I mean, that's just the practical. The real question is, how do I want to participate in the ministries at Tyler Street Church? And that's kind of the bottom line. I'd ask you to take this card home with you. Uh, pray over it, fill it out. Next Sunday, we'll be turn, asking everybody to turn them in. If you, if you forget next week, that's okay. You can mail it in. But uh, next Sunday is what we call Commitment Sunday, when these, start, when these are to be put in the offering plate, and they'll be collected, and we'll start building the budget for next year. But most importantly, I, want you, I would encourage you to ask God, how you should be, how I should be participating in the ministries of Tyler Street Church. Thank you. When does the worship service start? It's, it starts when the people gather together. When we gather t t together, that is when the, the worship starts. Sometimes it starts right when you come in the door. Sometimes it might happen out in the parking lot. And so throughout this service, it's not just the music and the prayers, but the whole service is an act, is an act of worship. That's why it's called a worship service, not a worship ceremony or a worship play, a musical. <laughs> it's a worship service because we serve, we serve our Lord. And so now we come to this part where we serve our Lord through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. So would you please join me in prayer? Eternal Lord, we are thankful that all that we have is a gift from you and that we live our lives in response to the grace that you have shown us. Therefore, we ask your blessings upon these, our tithes and our offerings, that they might be used to further thy kingdom in Oak Cliff, Texas. Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir. Our scripture reading for today, as you heard me tell the children, comes from the book of Isaiah. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. First, may we pray. Eternal Lord, we are thankful that you want to speak to us. 
And so may the words of our hearts and the meditation of our minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and you are our redeemer. And may we hear what you have to say to us afresh this day. For we ask these prayers in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In honor of God's word, I would invite you to please sing. Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called in the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And yet my eyes have seen the King, the capital K, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of God, and you say, Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. More than a century and a half ago, Soren Kierkegaard told the parable of the Duck Church, as you see in your insert. He described a community of ducks who waddled off to Duck Church with the duck preacher. The duck preacher spoke eloquently of how God had given the, the ducks wings with which to fly. And with these wings, the ducks could go everywhere and accomplish all their God-given tasks to do. And with these wings, they could soar into the presence of God himself. Shouts of amen were quacked throughout the congregation of ducks. At the conclusion of the service, the ducks left as they commented on one wonderful message they had heard, and they waddled back home. Too often, worshipers in the 21st century in America waddle away from church just as they waddled in, unchallenged and unchanged. Perhaps the reason is that we are creatures of habit. It has been said that week after week, congregants sit in the same place, in the same pew, follow the order of service that they know by heart, and listen to a sermon which they assume is attended primarily for somebody else. Occasionally, though, something happens. Unplanned, unrehearsed, uncontrollable, a serendipity. When I attended Baylor University, the college had a worship service called Serendipity. Maybe some of you have owned a Serendipity Bible. You know the author, Lyman Coleman. I learned that Serendipity means an aptitude for making unplanned, desirable discoveries. Serendipity also means finding something good without looking for it. In the midst of a worship service, worship happens. Someone's eyes are opened to a deeper awareness of the grandeur of God by the, the majesty of the music, such as the voluntary that we heard earlier. And new commitments are born. Someone recognizes his or her life story as the scriptures are read, and a new believer in Jesus Christ is born. Someone hears in the sermon, perhaps for the first time, about the love of Jesus, and a new hope is born. And we might be wondering, well, why such happenings occur here, but not there, 
or to this person, but not to that person. But experience has taught us that these events can't be explained, only described. The central character in this week's text is Isaiah, whose call to prophetic service came during a celebration of worship. The time was for him an encounter with God that was so profound that afterwards he could no longer see himself or his people in quite the same way as he had. To Isaiah, the entire building shook with the presence of God. But have you, get back to the question, but have you ever wondered, well, what about the other people that, that were there, thank you, what service, that were, that were there at that time? That service. I mean, didn't, did they have the same experience as did Isaiah? Did this act of worship affect how they viewed themselves or how they viewed God? How is it that two people can hear the same music, say the same prayers, hear the same Sermon, and one of them is utterly transformed by the experience while the other is <laughs> unmoved. What makes a service of worship a profound encounter with God for one person and a eh, routine experience for another? The answer appears in a moment that Isaiah describes in today's text. A moment when as the songs are sung and the prayers are being prayed and the high priest is intoning the greatness of God, unexpectedly, worship happens. It happens to him. As each one of us yearns for our own worship-filled moment. So let's listen to the prophet's Isaiah description of when this happened for him. Worship happens first whenever God is radically present. The word radical is used to describe an event or an experience that transcends the ordinary that is quantitatively and qualitatively different from other events or experiences of its kind. Our Covenant Sunday School class recently learned about how God has been radically present in revivals when the Holy Spirit has spoken to people and touched their lives with His grace. To speak of God as radically present is not to deny that he is always present everywhere, but rather to describe those occasions when the reality of God's presence bursts upon an individual's conscience in an unusually powerful way. To speak of God as radically present is to be overwhelmed with an encounter of the divine, which leads us to our knees in awe-filled worship. And when this happens, we can say that God is radically present. The radical presence of God can't be controlled. It can't be programmed. His presence can only be experienced. Isaiah's experience reminds us that the radical presence of God is found not only in the extraordinary, but also in the ordinary, Isaiah was engaged in a service of worship when he had a vision of being caught up in the throne room of God in heaven. We, too, are more apt to be surprised by the radical presence of God when our hearts are open to seeing him in the ordinary events of life. 
Such awareness, however, is made difficult for us because we live in a society that celebrates the spectacular and the sensational. If an event is not filled with more glitz and, and glamour and ostentatious hype than what came before, then for many, eh, it's a non-event. Nowhere is this more clearly seen than in Hollywood, where each succeeding production must have more and better special effects or pyrotechnics or whatever than its predecessor. This attitude can easily in infect churches in America as well. This attitude is reflected in church architecture and church programs and in annual celebrations. We 21st century American Christians try to make each worship quote, performance more dramatic than the last, as, as though through our efforts we can command the, uh, the radical presence of God. We are consciously or unconsciously educating an entire generation of believers that God is to be experienced only in the ornate or only in the spectacular. The problem with this is that overlooked is the possibility that God is present in the ordinary. That God can be radically present in the ordinary. And here, too, worship can happen. Thank you for the drink. What are you going to have for lunch today? Hmm? What are you going to have for lunch today? Are you going to go home and fix something? Or maybe you'll grab something on the way to the house. Or maybe you will uh, call DoorDash and have them deliver it. Perhaps you will drive to a restaurant. Uh, where do you want to eat today? I don't know. Where do you want to eat today? I don't know. <laughs> A way to exit such a circular conundrum might be to ask not where do you want to eat, but what kind of food do you want to eat? Or what are you hungry for? Barbecue? Italian? Home cooking? Chinese? Hamburgers? Seafood? Steaks? Pizza, like last week, or Tex-Mex? No, but the answer of Tex-Mex might throw us back into that loop of where do you want to eat because Dallas has so many Tex-Mex restaurants. <laughs> well, let's say you narrow the choice to two, to the Italian or the Chinese, Italian or Chinese. I think of those <laughs> questions and those answers when I am asked, well, which style of worship do you like better, traditional or contemporary? My answer might be, uh, yes, I like them both. My mother used to say of herself, well, the cook can't have any favorites because she has to like everything. Unfortunately, there is a tendency to consider contemporary music to be the real praise music. That is that worship happens only when contemporary music is played or sung. The word contemporary literally means con, together with, plus temp, or time, like temp is future, time, together with time, living or occurring at the same time time. You've heard that all music was contemporary at some point, such as when it was released. But we, as we have demonstrated this morning already, we can praise God when traditional music is played. Amen? Amen. Also, the terms contemporary and traditional are broad terms. There are many types of contemporary services there are many types of traditional services. Um, Fred, I'm sure you can attest to this, all those churches that you visited as a district superintendent. Some contemporary services 
feature live skits, videos, and three-minute songs, and are over and done with in 50 minutes. Some traditional services feature only a piano and have simply an outline of a worship guide, while others include pages and pages of readings, of liturgy. I have eaten delicious Italian food, especially before learning I was gluten intolerant. And I have eaten some delicious Italian food. I have eaten delic delicious Chinese food. And I've heard a worship consultant say that she had attended some well done traditional worship services and some poorly done traditional worship services, some well done contemporary services and some poorly done contemporary worship services. Therefore, the style of worship is not the determining factor as to whether worship happens. We want to give the Lord our best, not because we're trying to earn God's favor, but because we want to do so for him. Paul told the Corinthians to bring these two thoughts together that so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Worship happens also when human inadequacy is met by the grace of God. Human inadequacy is met by the grace of God. Yesterday evening, Lee Getman Allen reminded us of what happened back in February at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. 19 students lingered after most students had exited their usual uh, chapel service. One young man used that ordinary time to publicly get up and confess his sins. He repented of his sins before the other 18 that were there. And what happened? God, the Holy Spirit, made known his radical presence. In the middle of a 1.30 class in the afternoon, four students with tears running down their face burst into the class classroom and announced to the professor, Professor, you have to go to Hughes Auditorium. Revival is breaking. He dismissed the class and walked into the auditorium. He said, it was a little bit much to take all this in because it seemed so ordinary, so basic. But at the same time, it seemed so pure. That is the, the worship and what was going on. Another professor said, the worship we experienced was not polished. It had no technology behind it, but it was as pure as it could be. Hundreds of people and then thousands of people made their way to little old Wilmore. One couple who did said, people were surprised. They were thinking that they were coming to experience some awesome revival and then finding themselves in repentance. When we repent, we acknowledge that we cannot do it on our own. We cannot succeed on our own, that we have failed to do that, that we need God that we need to make room in our hearts for the Holy God to be present in us. Amen. We want God to give us new hearts. God is honoring human repentance. The Asbury outpouring lasted 16 days and spread to campuses across America and even to other parts of the globe. The radical presence of God caused Isaiah to recognize, perhaps for the first time, the spiritual shortcomings of himself and his fellow people from Judah. 
No sooner had Isaiah confessed his own uncleanliness and that of his generation that God impressed on, upon him the grace that forgives sins. Indeed, in this uh, text, we are led to understand that only because Isaiah was able to confess his inadequacy before God did God use him as a prophet to the people. For Isaiah, when human ina inadequacy was met by divine grace, worship happened. And third, worship happens whenever a grateful response answers a divine call. A grateful response answers a divine call. It's important for us to, to note that God's questions, whom shall I send, who will go for us, was directed not to Isaiah, but rather to the attending seraphim. God was talking to them. And then Isaiah simply overhears that question and immediately steps forward and says, ooh, 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 here I am, send me. And he did. Amen. Well, what could have prompted such a seemingly rash response? Gratitude. Isaiah had gratitude for God's grace. He had gratitude for God's forgiveness of sins. Not just his sins, but the sins of his people. Gratitude for the experience of God's presence was unlike anything that he had known before. So gratitude that issues forth in a positive action is the appropriate response to God's actions in the lives of his people. In that expression of gratitude, worship happens. You and I give back to God in response to the grace that he has shown us. We give because we are grateful for what the Lord has done. No one who is so touched by God as Isaiah was can remain the same. No one who has experienced the grace of God can remain silent. No one who hears in his or her heart the divine call for service can do anything less than respond with gratitude, here I am, send me. So in a moment like this, worship happens. Holy and awesome God, forgive us, O oh Lord, for our uncleanness. It must have been wonderful for the Isaiah to see you high and lifted. But what a solemn message he was given that people would hear his words but reject his message. Lord, it is human nature to expect people to respond positively to the glorious gospel of grace. And yet, see, so many people will hear the words of the gospel but not listen or understand because of the hardness of their hearts. So help us not to become discouraged when we try to share the gospel and we are rebuffed or scorned. So help us to be faithful in the work that you have given us to do. And we pray that we would hear and respond with repentance and joy for the honor of your holy name. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.